Let's analyze the first page of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, an acclaimed and truly unique novel, one that left quite fond memories on my own adolescence. So today I decided to revisit the opening page and see what makes it work. My Anatomy of an Opening series here on YouTube is a place where I break down the opening page of an acclaimed novel sentence by sentence to see what makes it tick, all in the hopes of gleaning a powerful lesson about story from the process. So without further ado, Let's jump right in. Hey, if you like this kind of video, don't forget to subscribe. The opening paragraph reads, The house stood on a slight rise, just on the edge of the village. It stood on its own and looked out over a broad spread of West Country farmland. Not a remarkable house by any means. It was about 30 years old, squattish, squarish, made of brick, and had four windows set in front of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. So this paragraph has a lot to read between the lines. Where to start though? Well, one of the funniest things to initially note is that classic Douglas Adams tone. We can't overlook that. Beginning with the first line of introducing our entire novel by simply introducing a house, a plain old house. The most delightful aspect of Adams is writing for me is that distinctly British tone and accompaningly absurd humor that Adams takes to the 10th degree. It pokes its head out of the ground in the way that Adams describes the house as squattish, squarish, made of brick. All three descriptors here are either odd, boring, or unnecessary. And that's why they give you a chuckle. When he continues, windows set in front of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. You see that classic British phrasing and odd humor shine through. It's all in the word choice and sentence structure. A modern American author would likely never write a sentence in such a roundabout way. Like, of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye, because it meanders to the point and almost reads clunky. You almost have to read it with a British accent to really get it. And had four windows set in the front of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. It talks around the subject. The sentence could easily be condensed to, the house had a displeasing look, or the house was ugly, etc, etc, etc. But it's Adam's choice not to do so here that makes it really his own. I would even caution aspiring writers against taking after this particular prose style, because it's something particularly found in novels written by similar authors from similar regions in the world. And unfortunately, it's a tone that doesn't always land well with wider audiences and is incredibly hard to really pull off. Authors like Terry Pratchett, J.K. Rowling, Neil Gaiman, they all do it quite wonderfully, but the worldwide successes are few and far between. There's actually a lot of work that goes into writing such textbookishly wrong sentences, and it should be attempted with caution. But I'm rambling now, so let's just move on and read the next passage. The only person for whom the house was in any way special was Arthur Dent, and that was only because it happened to be the one he lived in. He had lived in it for about three years, ever since he had moved out of London because it made him nervous and irritable. This paragraph continues with the same issue that we talked about a few lines ago. The only person for whom the house was in any way special is a monster of a sentence. Entirely wrong by many standards, but I love it all the same. And obviously the readers Adams accumulated loved it as well. Part of the iconic humor that Adams played with was stating blatantly obvious things in a roundabout or quirky way, like in the sentence, and that was only because it happened to be the one he lived in. It's wonderful because it tells the reader that Dent only happened to live in this house, which subconsciously tells the reader that it's not that serious, despite what we're going to learn in the next passage. It makes the fact seem dull and unimportant, but I think I've made the point of his sentence structure clear, so I'm not going to slow down and highlight each of them from here on out. It's in the next sentence where Adam mentions that Dent had moved out of London because it made him nervous and irritable, and on a base level this is not a particularly riveting part of the paragraph, but I will stop to note that it is important for character building. Without many words, Adams tells the reader that Dent is not one for large crowds or bustling cities. They annoy him, which gives us a lot to work with. It's actually in this way that Adams makes room for his other sentences to be so roundabout and quirky themselves. Note how not every sentence meanders through that odd tone. It's actually performed to a cadence. And lastly, these few sentences include our first character introduction. Funny how our main character, Arthur, gets an offhand mention only after the house has been thoroughly introduced. So let's read on and see where it goes. He was about 30 as well. 
tall, dark-haired, and never quite at ease with himself. The thing that used to worry him most was the fact that people always used to ask him what he was looking so worried about. He worked in local radio, which he always used to tell his friends was a lot more interesting than they probably thought. It was, too. Most of his friends worked in advertising. Now, this paragraph serves to say a lot about the character of Arthur Dent. A lot about one thing that he's a worrier. We actually use a lot of words to tell the reader that Dent is boring, worried, and irritable. We don't get many shades of Arthur, but really an intense color. Adams makes his point clear. Regarding the sentence level quality of this paragraph, it becomes ever clearer that we will not be experiencing this novel from Arthur's point of view, but from a narrator, which is evident in the way that he goes about framing the paragraph, telling us about Arthur and what he used to tell his friends. Rather than letting us as readers experience it our ourselves, or even showing Arthur himself contemplating this. The distance between the reader and character is actually quite far because of this, but it works because this is the tone and narrator that Adams commits to. But let's move on to the final passage. On Wednesday night, it had rained very heavily. The lane was wet and muddy, but the Thursday morning sun was bright and clear as it shone on Arthur Dent's house for what was to be the last time. It hadn't properly registered yet with Arthur that the council wanted to knock it down and build a bypass instead. Now, this concludes our first page. There's very little focus in it on the experience of Arthur Dent, and does little to throw the reader into Arthur's shoes, but rather looks on, almost laughing at Arthur as he stumbles through events, which is indicative of the rest of the novel. That's why it works. Nothing actually happens in this first page. We're simply told about things from a narrator's point of view, something that many writers are cautioned against doing. But if you're Douglas Adams, well, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want. So we close with that. Adams tells us ominously that the sun is rising on Dent's house for the last time. And this serves as our main hook. But the little twist at the end makes it impossible for me to not chuckle just a little. Because this isn't a scary story. As readers, we wonder, what on earth is going to happen to this house? This book is about the galaxy. It's an adventure, right? So something awful must be about to happen, right? But no, while awful things do happen soon, Adams curbs the final paragraph with the menial mentioning that it was merely the council that wanted to knock it down and build a bypass. And while that's quite unfortunate for Arthur, it's belligerently normal, almost boring. And with that word, I want to close this piece, belligerent. That is the name of the game for Adams. And the absurdly belligerent, odd humorous tone of this first page is just the beginning, as the future pages are littered with laugh out loud quips and ponderings that are worth the read alone. I have many childhood memories of incessantly quoting this novel with friends, laughing endlessly at the absurdity of it. So with that, our study of the Douglas Adams opening page ends. It's impossible to say all that could be said about the text in such a short time, and it only gets better from there. In fact, I don't think the first page actually does the novel justice. But then again, that's why you have a whole novel and not just the first page, which is important to note when doing these anatomy and opening segments, because there's so much more to a novel than just the first page. This series is merely an exercise for me, as well as any viewers who might find it valuable to grow as authors. So if you haven't read the book, go do that now. And if you have, well, I hope you've enjoyed this piece. Thanks for watching, like the video and subscribe to the channel and let me know your thoughts on this piece in the comments below. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys in the next video.